contraceptive benefits. This is the big thing with hormonal products. They have lots of non-contraceptive benefits. Be sure you know these. Some of them you've already uh, listed. So relief of cyclical problems. Uh, so decreases symptoms of uh, premenstrual syndrome. Um, can prevent a, a menstrual migraine. Uh, so it's very common in women. Uh, so if they have them, you can uh, treat right through them. Uh, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, iron deficiency, anemia. So women who have very heavy, long uh, periods can develop an iron deficiency anemia. So it dis decreases dysmenorrhea. So if they have severe, it's one of the treatments that you can do. Decreases menstrual loss. Uh, so for anemia, uh, it's, it's impressive. 40% after three months of use. Increases iron stores. So for women who continually run uh, anemic, these are helpful. Um, they maintain or increase bone mineral density. Um, so we'll see that when we talk about menopause, we even have estrogen patches, low dose, that we can use for prevention of osteoporosis. So 25% decrease in hip fractures in ever users compared to non-users at all ages. Another big one that I don't think we play up as much is the protection against ovarian and endometrial cancer. So here you're looking at ever users versus non-users. With ovarian it's the best because you arrest the ovarian pretty much what it's um, and this is mostly epithelial ovarian cancers. Uh, so it, the longer you use it, the more protection. So you'll see down there that there's a decline in relative risk of ovarian cancers for out to 30 years. That's huge. And I think that's with even just three to six months of use. Yeah. Now endometrial cancer is a little bit different. Here the more of the, the uh, Evidence is in those who use it for at least 12 months or more, but the same kind of thing. A 0.6 relative risk is big. That is a big drop. That means compared to someone who never used the product, their risk would be 1, yours is 0.6 if you have used them. Uh, protective effect uh, out for at least 15 years. Now cervical cancer is different. Uh, because women who use the pill have no protection, this one you'll have to write down because I didn't put it in there. So cervical cancer, the risk goes up in users. About two times uh, the normal, especially if they have an abnormal HPV test. So when you go in to have a, a pap smear, you can also get tested for HPV. Uh, and they'll test for all the variants that are put you at high risk. So cervical cancer is due to a virus, the HPV virus. Okay. So decreasing, um, so increased exposure um, to, of the cervix to that virus increases your risk of cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So the barrier, the um, the hormonal products do nothing to help you. Mm -hmm. Barrier products can actually cause a regression. So if there's an abnormal path. You can put them on a barrier method, and, you, and sometimes those will, will eventually revert to normal. The risk is, is um, of that cervical cancer, about two times normal, is stays as long as they use the product, and then it attenuates as the, once they come off. So it goes down. Yes? So if they're using barrier methods plus the pill? I didn't look at that data, but I would okay. assume it's lower. Okay. But you'd have to be using them every time. So that's the double alone. Double alone. I did look this up, but my remembrance is more because it's it's sexual. Uh, it is. Um, it's not the pill that does it. It is. It's it's the intercourse. It's the who you have intercourse with and who you're exposed to. Uh, than the pill itself, but the pill doesn't protect you. So it reduces the incidence of functional ovarian cysts. Again, it really doesn't do much to shrink a cyst that is there, but it will prevent others from developing. Uh, decreases the occurrence of benign breast cysts and fibroadenomas. Those can be a painful condition, make it more difficult to see the breast, especially as women get older and have their mammograms. 
A uh, couple others, oh, breast cancer, folks. So breast cancer, this has always been an issue from the beginning. And we had studies that said, yes, it increased the risk, and others that said, no, it, it decreased the risk. So the consensus now is that it is neutral on breast cancer. Doesn't help, doesn't hurt. Um, the others, um, let's see, I didn't put in hydro, uh, hyperandrogenism, uh, but it's certainly you can use it for acne. When we talk about women who have PCOS, uh, it can help with the hirsutism uh, as well. So it will decrease androgen uh, levels. Okay, so those are the non-contraceptive benefits. One thing to keep in mind with women who are obese is that, the, that these products may be less effective. So when you're getting into women whose BMI is 30 and above, um, if they're using a very low-dose estrogen, they may not have the same effect. This is particularly true and has been noted in women who use the patch. So Zulane is the patch. Uh, so women who are greater than 90 kilos, uh, we usually are, um, you have to warn them that it's potentially less effective. Women who are obese are also at increased clot risk. And you're putting them on drugs that make them an increased clot risk. So warning them about that is important. Okay. Questions about those? I guarantee you I will ask you about non-contraceptive benefits. They're too good and they're too uh, important to uh, not know. Concurrent diseases. Here is another that I will ask you about. So cardiovascular risk, one of the most important. That clot risk is very, very important. It's still low, still a low risk, uh, but uh, it's about 10 times higher with non-users uh, compared to non-users. Well, I, I shouldn't say 10 times. It's about one case per uh, 10,000 woman years versus 10 with on the front. So it's still low. You're going from 1 to 10. But two to four times is about what people usually quote in terms of clot risk. Now, we are using estrogen so low that there may be in women who still have low clot risk, but the risk of pregnancy is higher, uh, that there, these drugs could be considered. So here you'd have to take it into account. The first year of use is the highest risk, and then it goes down. We'll see this with other um, adverse effects as well. This applies to the ring and the patch as well. So pills are in patch, and it doesn't matter how you deliver the estrogen, it's the same. Let's look down to age. So there, this is a strong recommendation, contraindication not to use. Women who are over 35 and smoke at least 15 cigarettes a day, so how many is in a pack? 20. So they're about three quarters of a pack a day, very high risk for an embolic event. Heart attacks go up, stroke risk goes up, clot risk goes up. I don't know if they do it anymore, I didn't go back and look, but they used to uh, recommend that if you've got a woman who's 30, and she is smoking, you start warning her. I'm not that, you know, you're approaching the age where it's no longer safe for you to use this drug. So I'm just warning you that when you hit a certain age or a certain point, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to uh, prescribe this any longer. Okay. No one suspected uh, breast cancer, benign or malignant liver tumors. So I, I told you about the liver tumors in terms of most of them are benign. Most of this was related to the higher dose estrogen products in the past. But they were lethal, uh, could be lethal. So that's, that's where that warning comes from. Liver disease. Well, you can't get rid of the drug uh, if you can't metabolize it. That's where these drugs are, are we get rid of them. Diabetes. So look at the, the caveat here. 20 years or more, or they have evidence of complications, especially macrovascular. 
When you get into some of these cases, you will have to weigh the risk of pregnancy versus the risk of, of clot or the risk of a cardiovascular effect. So a woman who has a significant kidney disease and, be, and is diabetes, her risk during pregnancy is really high of an adverse uh, health event. Back to steel magnolias, that's what happened to her if you watched it. I haven't um, finished watching it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Migraines. So migraines, there's a difference. Migraines with aura, migraines without aura. So migraines with aura are the ones you're worried about because they have an increased stroke risk regardless of whether you put them on estrogen or not. But you increase that risk when, of stroke when you put them on an estrogen-containing product. Migraines without auras may be helped because they, a lot of them are menstrually related. So here's some, here's some things to think about. Most headaches, when women are placed on uh, a collimination product, will get worse. They'll either become more frequent or they'll become more intense. Usually, by about the third month, they will revert to normal, to baseline. So you're just going to, you can warn them uh, and then make adjustments, and I'll show you how those adjustments can be made um, on the next page or two. Um, Prolonged mobilization, really important because this is where the stroke, the, the clot risk comes. You put them in a, a, they go skiing and they break their leg and you put them in a cast, number one. You put them, to, for some reason, bed rest, I can't, some type of surgery that leaves them immobilized for a period of time. Especially if they're in a family that has clot risk, it, you're, that's very common. Okay. Uh, and then pregnancy or lactation, uh, uh, lactation we will talk about more when we get to breastfeeding. But pregnancy, there, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Don't need to take them anymore. Okay. Okay. Page seven. So if the product is a good fit, then what do you do in terms of products? So there's lots of products, and there, there's a chart there for you. And I've broken it down to all the different types of products there are, so we're going to walk through these. Um, so they're all combination products. The monophasics were the first ones that came out. Monophasics means you have a fixed dose of estrogen and progestin throughout the cycle. So if there's whatever's in the first pill is in the second pill. A woman plays Russian roulette and just spins the dial when they take their pills or they, they have a little circular, looks like a cribbage board, and they just punch them out wherever, they're okay. I used to see them in pharmacy. They'd bring them back. I'm like, what, what's the deal with just taking them in order? Some people don't like to be told what to do. Okay. <laughs> So those are usually, monophasics are usually 21-day pills, packs, and then they have a 7-day hormone-free. The very basics. Those are basic things. The biphasics. These were the first ones that came out. So what they did is they were the first to say, okay, we're going to vary the amount of progestin in the pill. We're going to keep the estrogen. I think that's right. Yeah. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they try to more uh, uh, replicate the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So estrogen level stays the same throughout. They use low progestin in the first phase, 10 days, and higher in the last 11 days. Again, usually they're a 21-day pack, and they are um, they're hormone-free during those uh, other seven days. Triphasics. There's two different types. There's fixed and there is variable. So the fixed, um, they keep the dose of estrogen the same throughout and they change the estrogen dose in three phases, usually seven days, seven days, seven days, and they just increase the dose of progestin throughout the cycle. So the triphasic applies more to the progestin part. Then there's the variable where they also vary the, the estrogen part and the progestin part. So if you've got somebody who's on a triphasic, then you would you would need to know which one. If they're having, especially if they're having side effects. So
So uh, monophasics, if you've not ever seen one, this is one example. So these are the hormone-free pills. Can you see that mouse? I can't see it. Oh, this doesn't work either. If you drag the mouse all the way to so the it doesn't work on huh? it doesn't work when I'm in presenter view, I guess. So the, the peach color are the monophasic all the same, the green or the hormone free. Some of them put throw iron in uh, those days. The biphasics you can see there's two different colors, two different blue, colors of blue, uh, and then the hormone free. And then the triphasal 28 is you've got three different colors. Uh, or four different colors, and the green is the hormone for you. I put that one in there because it, I've seen women do it. It's like there you cannot do it. You have to go sequentially and take them in order. Okay, so Natasia came out. So this one is called a... Um, a four phase, and what they did is they moved to a very um, shortened uh, hormone-free period, two days. So this gets around women, especially who have lots of side effects when the estrogen's removed. So if they have uh, menstrually related uh, migraines, this is a product you can think about using. So it uses the triphasic concept, but it also does a shortened hormone-free uh, period. Extended cycles became popular probably 15, 20 years ago, 15 years ago maybe. Um, so there's, court, there's lots of them, seasoning, quartet, seasonal. So these are products where you take it for 84 days and you're off, and you have a hormone free for seven days. Uh, so they go down to one pill a day, I, I'm sorry, uh, four cycles um, a year. Uh, let's see. The one look if you look under the extended cycle, um, season E has seven days of low dose estrogen. So they never the woman never comes off an estrogen dose. Again, women who have menstrual migraines, good product. Then you have the shortened hormone free is the low estrogen twenty four or Yaz uh, is another one. Uh, again. They've gone from seven days down to four. Same dose throughout the, the product. The patch is going to deliver the same amount every day. There the patch has got to be removed. So you've got to have somebody who uh, will pay attention to that. So patch can be placed in multiple places on the body. They are going to do a patch. Uh, for a week and take it off, put on a new one, so there's three in a package, and then they have a week of where they don't put the patch on. I'm sure there's people out there who wear a patch all the time and never take one off, and never... Okay, so the vaginal ring, I got mixed up with the patch, and so Fong corrected me. So it is, uh, it's left in place for three, three weeks, so it's one patch. Uh, for 21, I'm sorry, one ring for 21 days and then out for seven days for um, hormone free. Okay, you got to know those. You got to know the basics about them. And what you need to know is mostly they're in the middle. I'm not going to ask you all the minute details, but you've got to know what the different products mean. Um, Questions? Okay, down to the bottom. So drug interactions. So the biggest problem with these drugs is that they are metabolized by the liver and if you have inducers that will in speed up the metabolism, then they will tend to be less effective. Okay, so because your efficacy translates into potential pregnancy, that's uh, why these are important to know about. So antibiotics have been, this has been controversial for all the time that these products have been out. So estrogens really rely on enteropatic recycling. They rely on those uh, bacteria in the gut to be part of the metabolic chain of estrogens and so that the liver can take them back up and recycle them. So there's a recycling effort that goes on 
between the liver and the gut with estrogens. If you give an antibiotic and you wipe out that bacteria, you wipe out that recycling, you can decrease the efficacy of the, of the estrogen. It's only been proven with rifampin because it is so potent. And its effects are more on the liver itself. But I'm telling you, I would warn every woman, especially if they are in the first phase of taking their pills. So if they're in the early part of the cycle. Now if they're in an extended cycle, those are more difficult to predict. But if, let's say they're taking a 21 day cycle. If they're in the first few days, I would definitely tell them use a backup method. If they're at the back end of the cycle, the likelihood that they will uh, have escape ovulation and, and become pregnant is much lower. So the problem is, is decrease in efficacy. Some women will spot when they use an antibiotic because their, their estrogen levels will go down. Um, so it depends. I would always warn a woman. I would always tell them, you know, if you really don't want to be pregnant and you don't want to increase your risk, then use a backup method during this cycle. When you start your new one, you finish your antibiotic, you're okay. I'll um, tell you it's controversial. I went back even to this time and read, and a lot of people are like, eh, no big deal. Don't tell people to wear a back use a backup. I would tell them to use a backup. I would tell them, here's the risk. Anticonvulsants, these will chew up those drugs. Uh, we talked about this when we were doing seizures, is that sometimes, the, and the problem is, is that remember some of these drugs are teratogenic? Yes? Okay. So we don't want them to get pregnant. We also know that a seizure during pregnancy, high risk for termination of the pregnancy. Uh, so we need very good uh, contraceptive uh, products when women are taking anticonvulsants and they have a seizure history. Um, so some people have used higher dose estrogens, like more than 50 micrograms uh, a day. Uh, the other is to go to long-acting progestins, or an IUD, uh, as a, a, diff, as a uh, substitute. Remember the caveat, avoid estrogen-containing products in women taking Lamictal. Okay, so as a whole, when you see an anticonvulsant, I'd always look it up. Don't worry about all the, the details, but, but look it up. All right. So now a person has started a cycle and they come back and they've got side effects. You can group them in one of these four. If you've got too much estrogen, it's going to be, it's going to be pregnancy like complaints. Nausea, bloating, blood pressure goes up, headaches get worse, breast fullness, tender, tenderness, edema. So I just think pregnancy complaints. If, there, if there's not enough estrogen, it'll be menopausal complaints. Okay? They'll have breakthrough bleeding. Always want to know when is the bleeding occurring. Two or three days in, 20 days in. Okay? Because that'll tell you is an estrogen deficiency, progestin de deficiency. Or have you missed pills? I'd always ask that. Did you skip your pills? Did you flip it out of the, the package and it went down the sink? And you just went, oh well, you know, something like that. So, uh, progestin excess. These are a little bit harder. So too much estrogen, too much progestin. Think androgenic. So increased appetite. Think of your younger brother if you had one. Weight gain, tiredness, fatigue. They're sleeping all the time. Hypomenorrhea. Acne, oily scalp, hair loss, hair satism, goes either way. Depression, increased risk of vaginitis, breast regression. That takes a while. That takes higher dose ones to see that. Deficiency, they'll break through. So usually if they're having breakthrough bleeding, it's a deficiency of one of the hormones. Or they're not taking it. Amenorrhea or hypermenorrhea. So I would ask about those symptoms. It is common for women those first three months to have some type of symptoms. If they're tolerable and they're not putting them at risk, if they will live through the first three months, usually by after three months they come to a new norm. 
look at the bottom of the page. I'm not asking you to memorize this, this table, but I'm telling you it can be extremely helpful to you. So let me just orient you to that. Here's all the progestins on the left-hand side. You'll see as you go down there, their progestational effect varies. Whereas, um, like norgestimate and levonorgestrel, strongest progestins. If you go over and look on the, the far side, androgens, very high. So levonorgestrel, very strong progestin, it's a strong androgenic progestin as well. It's also anti-estrogenic. So it's going to give them a lot of those symptoms if it's too high for them. The other is estrogenic. So some of these will act like an estrogen. They'll sit on the estrogen receptor and make it think that it's an estrogen, and so they'll have estrogenic side effects. And I'll, you'll see most of them have anti-estrogenic. So if you've got a woman who says, I'm not taking this again, I want something different, or you've gone three months and they can't and the side effects don't resolve, this is where this table can be of help to you. Go to it and look at it. What side effect are they having? Move them to a different product. So the thing to keep in mind is that these drugs act differently. If they're really having problems with um, anti-estrogenic effects, move them to one that's got estrogen. If they're really having a trouble with androgenic, you can see you can move them to a lot less androgenic um, progestin. Okay? That's how I'd use that. I'd clip it out, i put it in my phone, and I'd look at it. And I bet you very few of your preceptors do that. But that, to me, is the beauty of that, little, of that is to look at it. They're going to have go-tos. They're going to have stuff that they, they start everybody on because that's what they're used to. And then if they come back with this problem, they'll put them on this one. If they have this problem, they'll put them on this one. Some of that is because your, your OBs and your GYNs are going to know this, and they'll, they'll do that. But others may just have go-tos that they are their second and third favorites. Okay. Next page. Adverse effects. All of these can increase blood pressure. Most of the time, it'll be minor, two to four millimeters. In your older women, women who have uh, pre-existing hypertension, be more careful. Have them check at home and give them parameters about when to call you. Uh, they, all of them can increase blood sugar. Most of it's due to the progestin side. Okay. So women in diabetes, you check their blood sugar. If you've got minor changes, then you can adjust their medicine. They can adjust their medicine. LDL, the progestin side, that androgenic side can increase LDL. So if you've got somebody who's got lots of, of risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors, high risk cardiovascular disease, you may want to look at a different product. You may want to go to like an IUD instead. Gallbladder attacks, most common in the first 6 to 12 months. And then it goes almost down. It's like if, you, if you've got a risk, it's going to show up. Quickly. Okay. Uh, cardiovascular disease we talked about. These are low, low, low. Your smokers are at your higher risk. People with high cardiovascular risk are at higher risk. Um, headaches. Um, well, I told you about the headaches. Almost all of them are going to get worse, but they will, most of them will come down. Your menstrual uh, migraines may get even better, especially if you use hormone. Uh, uh, you decrease the amount of hormone free time. Thrombotic risk we've talked about. The, uh, the progestins also increase risk in, in the, the, the uh, newer generations like the third and fourth generations are even higher risk. Uh, so keep that in mind in your folks who are at risk. This mnemonic can be helpful. Uh, aches. So abdominal pain, Gallbladder, usually chest pain, can be an MI. Headaches, migraine, um, eye problems, stroke, severe calf pain, clot. So you can teach them that. Uh, and if those side effects show up, they you need to know. Okay. Any question about the combination products? I didn't put when to start it. Uh, you can start them anytime. 
uh, in the cycle. A lot of them like, some people like to start them on a Sunday. Some like to start on the first day of, a, of the cycle, day one. Uh, for the most part, you can start any of them at any time. The later you start the cycle, you may want to have them use a backup. So I think that's why it's good to use it day one. If you start day one, you're, you don't usually have to recommend a backup. If they're going to start day seven or ten, they should use a backup that until through that cycle. Okay. Again, we use such low amounts that you can get FSH and LH are still, all you're doing is dampening it down. They are still producing LH and FSH. You still can get follicle development. You can still get follicular escape if you delay in taking it. That's why telling women don't ever, never delay the start. That's, that's because you can get ovulation to occur. Okay? The old products, they were so big dose, they were like those guns of Navarone. Do you buy Go Rent the movie? Oh, tell me, it's so good. You got to at some point. It's like pulling that out instead of a little Saturday night special. Okay? So, you, you, so the lower doses, lower side effects, much more tolerable, but they are also going to be less effective if you are not um, taking them on, on time. If you use the, if you've got women who want that hormone free, some women they want that period. They don't want to be on extended cycles or anything. You've got to make sure they understand the concept of 21 days of active pills, seven days of inactive pills. So here's a true story. So a woman, <laughs> she was not my friend. She's a good friend of uh, my, of a friend of mine. So she knew the concept. She knew that you got pills and you took them uh, and then you had a week off. Okay. So she was given a 28-day pack. She took them all and then she took a week off. So she had 21 days of active, 7 days with placebo, 7 days of off, 3 months pregnant. Yeah, yeah. So make sure people understand. You tell them, the pharmacist should tell them, people should really make sure they understand, here's how to, here's how to take them. I think she took them for 21 days. And doubling up does not, there, there, there are all kinds of things about doubling up and taking extra if you miss and all that. take them all at once. Had a woman one time who was like, I have no idea what made her think this. She was going away for a weekend with her husband, decided didn't want to take her pills, didn't want to have to take them with her. So she took them all on Friday. Yes. <laughs> Called, I threw, I threw up. What do I do? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm telling you, people do weird things with these things and they, because they don't know. They just don't know. So you have to always go back over. Okay. Moving on to page 10. These are the progestin only. So if you have people who have content indications to uh, estrogen but want a hormonal product, the progestins can be used. Uh, the progestin pills are not as effective uh, as the combination product, but some of the long-acting injectables or implants are very effective. So they're, um, if you look under B, who's a good candidate, very high inherent efficacy. Depo-Provera, very good. Many pills are good if you take them every day. I would not do many pills unless I had an older woman who was really regimented. But many pills require a three, you gotta take within a three hour window every day. And you gotta, and you take them every day. Uh, Mirena, Nexplanon, so these are really good and their continuation rate is good, which tells you women are satisfied with them. User technique, except for the mini pill, pretty good because they're either implant or you just have to show up and have your injection uh, every three months. Can be used again across all ages, even teenagers. Their intercourse independent for the most part. Uh, fertility, here's the problem. Fertility is delayed. So this is the one I was telling you. Depo Provera, nine to eighteen months. So you have to warn people if you are thinking of, that you'll want uh, a child in the future, you have to um, you have to plan six to eight months to clear from the body. 
Fertility is more reversible. The implants and the IUDs, they're, they're reversible as soon as you take them out. Risk of sexually transmitted disease, they don't predict. Um, IUDs can be, I've read now that IUDs can be inserted after, right after delivery. Um, so usually they can be um, introduced uh, before women should be having intercourse. They can be used in breastfeeding women. So this is the big advantage of them over the combination products is they don't have any effect on milk volume. So in women who are on anticonvulsants, here's one of your preferred products, the long-acting Depo, uh, uh, Provera, or your IUDs. Non-contraceptive benefits, no estrogen. Decreased menses, most of these women will get amenorrheic. The big problem with these is that when they first start taking them, their, their cycle is very unpredictable. So that's why most women quit it, because they never know when they're going to have a period. They usually, once, if they can stand it, after a few months, and usually by nine months, they're all amenorrheic. So that's where that helps with the uh, anemia. Decreased dysmenorrhea, like we saw the others. You get the benefits in cancer re reduction. They are contraindicated. You got smaller amount number here: pregnancy, duh, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, breast cancer, or active liver disease. So these are the different products. There's not as many. So you've got Depo-Provera. It's an IM injection. Usually these are nurse visits every three months. Uh, the biggest thing is getting women to show up, because if they don't show up on time, then you have to do pregnancy tests, and it just becomes more of a problem. Uh, they do make a sub-Q now uh, that is uh, a little bit easier and more comfortable for women to receive. Many pills every day. Next, Planon is an implant. It's an implant usually under the arm, uh, lasts three years. Um, and then Morena, and then there's there's all kinds of, there's uh, Loletta and Skyla, so they are three to five years uh, for the IUDs. Drug interactions are few, uh, so you'll see there the antifungals, the antifungals. For the mini pill. Okay, so what's the biggest problem with these? Weight gain. And it's huge. Uh, and it's progressive. This says five pounds in the first year, eight pounds in the second year. Uh, I have seen on average 15 pounds. Uh, so that's that's the big downside on these. Uh, irregular periods I talked about, the amenorrhea, breast tenderness, headache, depression, nervousness, tiredness. Usually these will go away. Uh, they will build a tolerance to them. Abdominal pain, uh, more uncommon, ovarian cyst or an ectopic pregnancy. Decreasing HDL, so your women who've got cardiovascular disease may not be the best. On page 12, bone mineral density. This is the big bad part of these, is that you don't have the estrogen, so you can see a decrease in bone mineral density. Uh, so if you've got women in their uh, young years that are building bone, uh, this can be a problem. So it's, it's usually with longer than two years. And this is depo provera, so doesn't it, it doesn't account with the, uh, the progestin IUDs. With the IUDs, the bigger problem is early on is periods can be very crampy and painful and heavy. Usually that will go away over time, uh, but it, it, can cert it can certainly last for several months. Uh, they can become pregnant. Uh, they can perforate their uterus. Uh, it can move outside the uterus. It can cause uh, inflammation and uh, infections, but those risks are low. Questions about yes. Question. What are your thoughts on the copper IUD? Uh, I do have it in the very. Okay. I've got Paragard and think it's at the very end. So okay. can you wait or do you want me to? Barrier methods. So who is a good candidate for barrier methods? Your inherent efficacy is less, but it's not bad. 
it's mostly goes because people don't use them or don't use them appropriately. So you'll see there for the sponge, the diaphragm, the female and the male condom, pregnancy rate. Um, and that's with perfect use. Female condom, less than 1%. Typical use, 21%. It just tells people don't use them correctly. So big disparity between perfect and typical use with the barrier methods. So your older patient, your motivated patient, people who don't have sex very frequently, those are people who are probably going to uh, benefit from these the most. Age, any group can use them. They are intercourse dependent, so they're cheap, relatively inexpensive. But you got to plan. You got to have them on you. Uh, fertility, no effect on fertility. Next page. Risk of tra sexually transmitted disease. These are the best. Uh, male condoms, female condoms, the best. Um, okay, so the male condoms and female condoms, the best, don't look at that. I, I thought I had a picture that I want to show you, but I guess I'll take it out. Uh, so the diaphragms, the condoms, go down to the second one. They will, affect, they will protect against bacterial and some virus. So HPV, so if you got an abnormal pap, this can lead to a regression of that abnormality. Uh, herpes simplex, HIV, hepatitis B. These are mostly the latex condoms. There are natural condoms. latex and natural skin. So natural skin, they're made of lamb cecum. So, but the problem with them is that the, the space between the layers and the pores between the fibers that make it up are much bigger than what you get in latex. So they are not recommended for like protection against HIV. Uh, or the, the bigger are the viruses because they feel like they can move through those layers easily. So the latex, the cheaper for one, uh, and you can get non-latex. There are non-latex uh, condoms out there as well uh, that are also inexpensive and are And if so, if someone has a latex um, allergy, there are non-latex that are available. And I've given you the CDC's comment there on the third about natural membrane condoms. The diaphragm, it can protect against some, but it can't, it won't protect the outer genitalia of women um, or the, uh, so there's, a, there's one of the, kind, that's Kaya condom. So you'll see that it can prevent uh, exposure to the cervix and everything upstream, but the vagina and outer uh, external genitalia will not be protected. <laughs> What's the chatter? Pretty y'all. It's big. Huh? It looks big. <laughs> well, condoms are, I mean, uh, diaphragms are pretty big. So there's different types of, of diaphragms. Um, all of them are made now out of silicon. Uh, the old ones were made out of latex, so, and they'll last forever. Uh, so you may have some older women who have latex um, diaphragms. Um, Kaya is a one-size-fits-all. Uh, Janssen makes ones that are fitted, so they would have to come into a provider to be fitted. Uh, well, because you're different sizes, and if you've had babies, you're, everything's stretched out. So the more babies you have, the, every time you have a baby, you have to have a refit uh, of your hmm. diaphragm. Diaphragms are always meant to be used with a spermicide. So you'll see that spermicidal jelly up there. Uh, the combination is pretty good. Uh, the other thing about them is they can be inserted prior, uh, a couple of hours prior to intercourse. Uh, but they have to be left in place for at least six hours. 
um, and they can be left in place for up to 24 hours. You can have multiple sex uh, intercourse if you want to. <laughs> so there's a lot of advantages, but very few women use them. Less than 1% of women use them. Um, but there's a lot of advantages. You take good care of them, they last. The silicon um, ones will last for about two years. The latex will last for 10 plus years. Not something you're familiar with. Really? So this is what, if you were going to go in and be fitted by a provider, I'm going to go over, I'll just tell you now, I can't do it all day. If you, are, if you go in to be fitted, then these uh, products come in multiple sizes. They also come in three different rims. Uh, so the rims have springs in them that will hold them in place. Uh, so the, the provider will, will insert them and teach the woman how to insert them. So they're designed to fit up over the cervix. They're held in place by that spring, but also vaginal mus muscle wall. Uh, and then you put spermicide in the, at the dome of the, the diaphragm and around the side. And then it sits there and it, it forms a physical and chemical barrier. So very effective. How you should see your faces. So it's really interesting. This is the one who usually brings the most uh, the most uh, expression from people. But if you think about it, it's, it's very effective, uh, especially if women who can't get a partner. So here's one of the things. If you have a woman who is keeping from her partner what, she, what product she uses, it's not safe for her to do that or to know or to plan. This is a product that, that can work for her. Um, so um, let's see what else can I tell you. Again, this one came out in, in the 60s or so uh, when women were really moving away from high-dose combination products. Uh, so it requires one fit, and unless you're losing weight or you've had a baby, the, that fit stays with you for as long until something changes in your architecture. Questions about those? Huh? Uh, you wash them, you inspect them for holes. Uh, if you've ever had latex nipples, like for a baby, it's the same thing. You wash them, uh, you dry them out. Some people put talcum to just absorb the, uh, the moisture. And they, they, you, they come with little containers that you store them away in. Again, they'll last 10 years with good care. The silicon ones will last two years. So, so because of the problem with latex, so you've got about 10% of the population that is, uh, that is allergic. So they came out with this one called Kaya. Uh, and it's silicon. Uh, it's a little bit easier to insert. It has little uh, grip dimples, they call them, at the side. makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to uh, get a hold of. Uh, and the contraceptive jelly would go in the middle. And the other thing that sometimes makes diaphragms hard is just their ability to, uh, to be removed. So what they did with the construction here is that you see that kind of projection up against the pubic bone. Well, one is it stabilizes, it keeps it in place a little bit better, but it also a it, it gives a place for the woman to hook a finger and then remove it. So that, that becomes some of the problems with like the sponge and the diaphragm is if women tense and they, get, they can't relax, then sometimes it gets hard to remove those, those products. But with practice, they're, they're pretty easy. Here's a FemCap. It's very similar. Um, it comes in three different sizes. It, it just fits up over the cervix and is a place for spermicides. So that's the fin cap. There's another one called Leah Shield that's very similar to that. Here's today's sponge. So going off of old natural sponges, these have been around for about you know, 25, well, no, 30 years. Um, so the sponge is, is a one size fits all. That's the downside. But it's impregnated with non 9, which is a spermicide. It has a gram of it in it. So 
So it's already in it. You don't have to apply it separately. Um, and it's inserted again. It's like a, a reusable or a um, one-time diaphragm. It has a it's very pillowy. It's very soft. It has a little dimple here that fits up over the cervix. And it has a string that a woman can hook uh, with her finger and remove. Um, so that's their one-time use, throw them away. The only problem is they're better for nulliparous women, which would be what? No. Never, had, never been pregnant, never given birth. Okay. If you're multiparous, and then you usually have more space there that the sperm can get around. So not as, not as effective in multiparous women. Here's the female condom. Are you familiar with it? So what they did with this is they made it, it's a combination of a condom and a diaphragm. So it has two rings. That inner ring, so can you see that? Okay, so that ring fits up over the cervix just like um, a diaphragm would. And then you have the uh, condom portion, and that outer ring is very wide, so it covers a lot of the external genitalia. It's probably the best in covering the mucous membrane. If you have someone who is really wanting to protect themselves against an STD, they're easy to insert. They're one time. They're a little expensive. Uh, they do come. They're in silicon, so they're not uh, latex. They can be used with a spermicide. You can buy them over the counter. Go down the condom aisle and look for them. Questions about those? It's just different products to meet different needs. Okay. You don't have to like them. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> but when you start meeting people who can't use hormones, then you're, you have to really look at these other options. So there's what the female condom would look like inserted. So you can see there's, there's hardly any skin that is exposed. Spermicides. So spermicides come in a lot of varieties in terms of dose forms. Uh, so you've got most commonly people tend to use either suppository, foam is a very common one, uh, also the, the jellies. So know that the jellies are different. If you are going to use them with a diaphragm, then you want one that doesn't spread a lot. And so they'll say on there specifically for diaphragm use. Um, and they don't, they stay put. If you are going to use them as an additional or supplement, you could even use them by, your, by themselves, but they're not as effective. You want ones that spread. So you would use the, the spreading or the, the ones that aren't intended for uh, diaphragm. Okay, so see the difference? Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing to note with the um, spermicides is how fast they melt. So a lot of people like the, um, uh, the uh, suppositories, but they have to melt. So you've got to insert them at least 15 minutes before intercourse so that they'll melt in time. The, the, the jellies, the foams are immediately effective. They also come in, uh, you see the little film at the bottom of the, of the slide. They are, they are just a very small little square. You fold them up in quarters and, and insert them. Uh, just a different different way to uh, to apply product. There's the film, and those are the different spermicidal jellies and foams. So if you've got a diaphragm in, you're going to have intercourse multiple times, then you could use a foam, because it's got an applicator, to insert more uh, uh, spermicide every time you have intercourse. That's the recommendation. Um, if you'll look on page 13, um, let's see, where do I put the... Now look on page 14. C. 
so here I have given you a table that is that summarizes all of these different uh, products. So learning the, the difference between them. Um, materials are all silicon. Nothing is made out of latex anymore. Sizes, some are one fits all, and some have multiple sizes. Some are reusable, some are not. Some of them require a prescription, and some do not. Spermicides can be used with all of them. They could all be used in conjunction with a male condom. Um, when to insert. So the thing with the spermicides is does it have to melt, or can it be used right away? Those are the big differences uh, between them. How long to leave in place, if they can be. When to remove them. Refit after pregnancy. Y'all talked about toxic shock syndrome? Okay. So products that re... So years ago, long before you were born, probably when your mothers were your age, uh, they came, they developed a tampon, I think it was the OB tampon. They developed a tampon, it was very absorbent. The problem was it was so absorbent, it kept all that menstrual uh, sloughing. Uh, um, and women probably left them in, retained them too long, and they became an excellent medium for staph aureus. And so fatal infections from those started happening. And they developed, they called it toxic shock syndrome. Um, so the, it was a very rapid onset, vomiting, high fever, uh, blood pressure dropped, uh, and a rash. And those women died within a day. They even had men who got it, um, like wrestlers, and um, I can't remember exactly what products they, but it was mostly women. They figured out it was the tampons, they reformulated it. You hardly hear about it anymore. Uh, but products like um, the sponge, uh, the, um, the diaphragms, any of those that would retain menstrual fluid for long periods of time are recommended not to be used during the cycle. Um, so that would be a downside of those. Um, on page 15, the spermicides um, tells you about the different forms that are available. Only one on the market mount now is non-oxanol 9. There was another one that wasn't used very often, so they went down to that. Advantages, high safety, low toxicity. They can be used with anything, any product you can add a spermicide to. They're over the counter, don't require your partner to uh, participate. Immediate protection, it can be a backup. Okay, condom breaks. You could, and you didn't use a spermicide with it. With it, you could uh, use that. Uh, can be uh, can be a source of lubrication uh, for uh, a woman if needed during intercourse. So that's why most of the condoms are have spermicides already uh, in them. Disadvantage: uh, There are some spermicides coming down the mark uh, in the in the pipeline that are less irritating. That's the biggest problem with them, especially if you use them frequently is there they are irritating to both partners uh, they can cause an increased risk of, of UTIs vaginal infections in women uh, there was some concern uh, several years ago that they might uh, increase the risk of congenital defects and that is they do not um, so very good add-ons um, on page 16 the, the Paragar, the IUD so Paragard is a copper, um, like what Taylor re uh, referred to, is here's Morena and there's Paragard. Very good, non-hormonal, uh, can be left in place up to, I've read for at least 12 years, people have done it. Uh, so very effective, very cost effective. Um, Special populations, deliberous women. Women who've had a lot of babies are more likely to expel them. That's, that's one of the problems. They can be used women who are breastfeeding, <coughs> women who are immunocompromised, diabetic women who have vascular disease. This is our, our uh, method of choice. Um, history of uh, VTEs. Uh, you remove them, 
fertility comes back. Now, if you've worn them for 12 years, your fertility is going to be different. Non-contraceptive benefits are listed there. So breastfeeding women, got vascular disease, and you need a uh, inherently good uh, product, breast cancer, clot history, uh, migraine, high blood pressure, stroke. These are products to keep in mind. Side effects, the, the bigger problem is, is in the beginning because they cause a lot of cramping, spotting. Uh, they can certainly be exposed. Uh, mostly during periods. Um, so there's that shows you what, how they sit in the uterus. There shows you how they're in, they're inserted. So they require a visit to uh, a provider. And they have strings that hang down the cervical canal. You can teach women to check those uh, to check placement. Any questions about those? Okay, last part, emergency contraception. So the copper seven, question? Well, it's a small amount and it's, it sets up an inflammatory response. So it's better put rocks, I guess. <laughs> 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 Okay, so the number one, the best post-coital uh, emergency contraceptive is this, is the Paragard. Uh, you can insert it up to five days after an unprotected sex, and it continues to give you then birth control protection. So what is the risk? If you have unprotected sex around the time of ovulation, what's the likelihood of you becoming pregnant? 26%. Okay. So most of the pills you have to take within 72 hours, but this one can be inserted up to um, five days, whatever that is, 120 hours. Okay. So the different products, so this is one, probably should be... Um, yeah, so extremely effective, the copper IUD, and then moderately effective are the, the pills. So the ones that are on the market are levonogestrel. So plan B one step uh, is the probably the most common one. It's over the counter. It's recommended for women 15 and older. Uh, I'm sure women, girls younger than that probably get a hold of them as well. Uh, doesn't require a prescription. Um, you can walk up and ask the pharmacist for it. They're pricey. They're about, about $30. What did you all sell them for? Uh, they're like 60 bucks everywhere. Uh, I went online, like the, uh, the uh, like Take Action is uh, like $37. Walmart, like the kind of Target. Target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like $59.99. On the line there, they're like in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood. What? $34.99. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Planned Okay, so let's say between $30 and $60. I can use that. All right, so listen, they, these products are levonogestrel 1.5 milligrams. They need to be taken within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. They're one dose. The biggest problem with them is they make women very sick, so they often throw them up. Yes? So um, a lot of Plan B is going over it like on the shelf, so you don't have to go to the pharmacy. Really? Really? Well, because um, there was, I was talking to my pharmacist about why it was, and she said that um, if people were smart, they would see a lawsuit coming up. So like a 15 year old was pregnant and too really embarrassed to go get Plan B or had sex. And then the family can sue like CVS or whatever because okay, it's yeah. over the counter. Yeah. And but it's behind the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So there's like a discrepancy there. So I always look at the pharmacy huh. when I'm standing there. So the last ones I've seen are there, mm -hmm. but they're and they're visible. So yeah. people can. Oh, I guess in my story was over. So are they do in your in is Walgreens doing that? They put them over the counter. I don't know. See, but that was my CVS store, but I went to one there more, and it was behind. 
long before they do in Europe pharmacy. They moved, they moved over the counter. Oh, they did? Yeah, I was like on the shelf. And are you, where do, do you work Walgreens? No, CBS. CBS. Okay. Yeah, did you have a shelf? Somebody had a hand up there. Okay. <laughs> All right, so there is another one. There's called Ella. And it is an anti-progestational agent. Okay, so it's a pill also. Uh, and it prevents, uh, it also prevents ovulation and it is also effective up to five days after undetected intercourse. Okay. It can be taken any time during the menstrual cycle. Contraindicated pregnancy is suspected because then it would become an abortifacient because it would, it would act like uh, are you for a um, rapid return in fertility? So s some of these, like with levonorgestrel, some women will have a delay of several days of their period. Uh, so it's one thing to warn them. Um, oh yeah, I did put it on the last page. Cycle length is increased by 2.5 days. Warn them because they're going to be nervous. They're going to be buying pregnancy test. Okay, and Paragard I've got down there is, um, is another option. Okay, I apologize for running over. I got two verb bumps in the first. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Is it just a common rule for the hormonal birth controls if you take like two or three pills that it acts like plan B? Because I feel like I've heard that. Oh, they do. Hormonal. Women do. Yes. But does it have the same effect? Yep. Okay. Yep. But you get the estrogen part. Yeah. Any other questions? Will it delay the their period even if they're on a birth control pill? I think so. I don't know that for sure. Any other questions? All right, I'll see you on Thursday.